Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. We're going to stand and sing holy, holy, holy and then remain standing for prayer. But as we sing this song this morning, think about the holiness of God. Good morning. If you'll take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 12, we're going to read verses 41 through 48. Luke 12, 41 through 48. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us? or even to all. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give him his portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants, and to eat and drink, and to be drunk, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with fewer stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. 
Joey, bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we once again bow before you and acknowledge you to be the ultimate power, Lord. We thank you for this. We know that everything is in your control. We know that you know what's going to happen before it happens for us down here. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, you have the plan. And Lord, I thank you that you were willing to come and to die on the cross so that we may be saved. Lord, embolden us throughout the week ahead to share this gospel. Lord, we just pray that we will be vigilant to work hard, Lord, as time draws near. Lord, we just pray that you will bless this congregation. We pray that you will continue to help us to minister to this community, both to Arlington and the areas around, Lord. And we just pray that we will be a beacon unto them, that we will see the needs that the people in our community have, and we will be there to meet them, Lord. We pray that you'll be with our missionaries that we send across the globe. We just pray, Lord, that you will guide them, direct them, keep them safe, keep their eyes on you, and keep them strong in their, uh, their work to spread your gospel to all the corners of the earth. Lord, we just pray that you will be with our uh, nation at this time. We just pray, Lord, for a peaceful transition of power, and we pray that... Uh, Again, Lord, that you will be with us, the Christians, that we will turn to you and we will do what we are to do, Lord, at this point in time. Lord, you just think of those who have gone through much this week. We think of Nan and her family with the loss of her father. We just pray that you'll be with uh, them, Lord, at this time and get them through this. We think of Shirley Dodge and others that have been ill, Lord, and Shirley spent some time in the hospital this week, but we rejoice that... She's back home now and doing some better. We just pray that you'll continue to protect uh, us all from the various illnesses that are around. And we know that you are the great physician and that uh, the power of healing is from you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you as we, on Wednesday, will observe Veterans Day. We thank you for all those who were willing to serve, Lord, and to do their duty to protect us and to... Uh, uphold our nation. We just pray that we will not forget what they've done for us. And Lord, once again, we just pray that you'll be with everyone here, that you will continue to strengthen us throughout the week ahead and let us keep our eyes on you. Let us daily be in your word, studying and memorizing. Let us be constantly in prayer to you, Lord. We just uh, praise thy name, for it's in thy name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. of triumph trod by faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on or every field the faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield faith is the victory 
victory. Faith is the victory. tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird above the earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with the shout faith is the victory White raiment shall be given before the angels. He shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Thank you, Jay and Holly, you sang that like you meant it, praise the Lord. We are so thankful that you're here this morning, and I, I just want to say thank you to the veterans who are among us, and I think what we'll do is at the invitation, we'll have you come down, and uh, I'm going to ask Brad uh, Dodge, uh, Brad uh, Bell, if he would lead us in prayer at the end of our service, and we want to recognize our veterans that way. Speaking of Brad Dodge, keep praying for him and his mother. Uh, Shirley came home from the hospital yesterday, and she's still recovering. Um, some requests here, not requests, these are... Um, Announcement, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Got to get my head on straight here. Um, tonight, if you serve on the uh, pulpit committee, we'd like to have you meet after the life group, which is at 6 o'clock. And then on Monday night at 7.30 is a full board meeting. On uh, this Thursday, they were scheduled to have a fellowship back in the fellowship hall, but I got a text this week, and Amber is asking that we move that to December the 3rd. So if you were planning to come this Thursday, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, that's been moved now to December the 3rd, so you might want to make a note of that, okay, the Outreach Freezer Ministry. On, this, on no, November the 22nd is Thanksgiving offering here at the church. Uh, we're going to have uh, half of that go to our missionary families and the other half go to our uh, congregation, our um, building fund. Boy, I'm, I'm slipping gears here. Congregational meetings after the morning service that same day. And then Elena has put a box once again in the fellowship hall, and she's collecting uh, unperishable items for uh, the city, Finley City Mission, and we're always thankful for that. Speaking of uh, veterans, uh, Logan is with us this morning. Logan uh, kind of came up in this church, and he went down to boot camp in South Carolina somewhere, and then they sent him over to, was it Korea? And he's in South Korea now serving, and I'm thankful that he's with us this morning, too. I'll maybe have you come at the end of the service. We'll all just, we'll pray for our veterans, okay? Glad that you're here. Glad that our... Uh, Worship team is here, ready to start singing, so I'm going to move out of the way, unless you want me to sing with you. <laughs> I trust that you all sing with us. Let's please stand as we sing our worship songs this morning. Same God who's 
Was that Kenley Kayan that said hallelujah? <laughs> that was great singing this morning. I want to ask that you please turn to the book of Luke and how timely, how relevant is this little paragraph that Mike read for us a minute ago. If you want encouragement and comfort, which I needed a lot of this morning, I went to Sunday school, we spoke from the book of Psalm. But I'm going to turn a corner now, we're going to look at the book of Luke, this deals with our responsibilities. It appears to me personally that the church is going to have a lot of opportunities to see what we're really made out of. I hope you've been paying attention as we've been following the Lord Jesus along to the cross at Calvary. You see, he knew what was coming. He's God. He knows the end from the beginning. The disciples did not know, and so he was preparing them. And uh, I feel like we need to be prepared for the inevitable that's going to come. And i got to find my Bible first to do that. There it is. I'll get to it. I sent out this text to you this week. It kind of ministered to me, and I thought it would minister to you. Would you agree that days are evil? And the whole book of Ephesians is uh, summed up in one word, and that's the word worship, which is what, where this is taken from, Ephesians chapter 6. And I notice as I've studied the book of Ephesians that you don't just worship the Lord in chapter 4 after all the theology in chapters 1 through 3. That book takes a turn. And from worship, he asks us to walk. If you obey that, if you're worshiping, which means I, like you just did a minute ago here, with, you express with all that you have to all that he is. Isn't he a great God, by the way? He's still on the throne in case you didn't know that. But that's what church is all about. We come and we experience, we express our worship to him. All that I am to all that he is and all that he does for me. And if I really believe that, I'm worshiping, I start to walk in that direction. About five times he asks you to walk uprightly and don't walk as children in the dark and things like that. When you get finally to chapter 6, he says, I want you to prepare for one more thing. As he's winding down the book, and that's spiritual warfare. Worship, if you do it correctly, leads to a daily walk with the Lord. But make sure you dress appropriately. Because sooner or later, if you follow God long enough... There will be an all-out assault. Where are my veterans this morning? <laughs> they don't understand that principle. Military terms. Now, as I was thinking about this, I came over to Luke. I thought, boy, the Lord's been asking us from verse 1 of chapter 12 to be genuine. Are you genuine this morning? He was interrupted twice in this uh, chapter, the first time by one of the brothers that said, Lord, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance. And then the Lord said, beware of covetousness. He wants us to be genuine. He wants us to be content. Then he looked at his disciples and said, I don't want you to worry. I want you to be calm. Which really is what this psalm is about here. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. But to be calm. Last week we looked down at verse 35 where he asked us to be ready. Have our loins girded and our lights burning. But Mike read a minute ago in verse 41 where Peter interrupts him again. And he says, Lord, what are you trying to say? And now the Lord asks his people not just to be ready but to be faithful. And can I tell you that as a pastor, I am so grateful to people who are faithful in ministry. I mean, they do it week in and week out. And week in, and we, we got people here that have taught Sunday school for years, and they don't get any attention. We never have a special day. We probably should. But I mean, just faithfully, you can count on them, like the clock. We got people that work in KYB. We got people that work all over the place. Faithful, 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 faithful. So he says, as you're following me. I want you to be faithful. And I'm going to give you just a, I love to narrow down definitions to just something that's concise, that can stick in my heart, in my memory. And if you ask me, I like to pull it out and say, that's what it means. What does it mean to be faithful? When you signed up to trust the Lord, so to speak, when you repented of your sin and put your faith and trust and completely in Jesus Christ, you started following him. 
whether you know it or not, you said, Lord, I agree with you to do whatever it is you ask me to do. By the way, when you join the military, I think they do the same thing. I've seen pictures of guys getting on buses, right? They just left mama's house. And go down to some of these uh, basic training, boot camp, they call it. And I mean, even before they get off the bus, the drill sergeant walks on board the bus and he lets you know right away who's in charge. Now, your mama is back there, but I'm your mama now, right? Remember those words? When you begin to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, he calls you and he calls me to be faithful. And that's pretty pleasant when you're on the bus ride down to boot camp. But I'm telling you something, as soon as you keep following the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to require some unexpected sacrifice. And I'm going to say it again where I started this morning. I believe the church is about to have a golden opportunity to be the church. To show your true colors. Do you really believe it or do you not? So that's what this passage is all about this morning. How faithful are you? Or how quickly will you cut and run? And say, if it's going to be like this, I quit. I'm going back home to mama. God wants his people, among other things, to be faithful. Since it's Veterans Day, I thought I'd start with a little story here about veterans. This young man died in um, Afghanistan. He was on board a Chinook helicopter along with several of his uh, comrades. And they took on enemy fire, and for whatever reason, the helicopter like that, which you've worked on, right, Doug? They're not supposed to get shot down. But this one was shot down. He died, and several of his comrades What's very interesting to me reading the story is that they brought his body back home to Rockford, Iowa. And they weren't supposed to take pictures of it for security reasons. They were having other Navy SEALs speak on behalf of John Tumelson. But somebody took a picture of what was going on. It just touched their heart so much. Because one of his friends got up to speak on his behalf. And as he got up to speak, this dog <laughs> that belonged to this Navy SEAL, followed the speaker <laughs> up to the casket. And then he lay down for the entire service. He had a faithful master. His master went out into eternity. But the dog showed his loyalty, his allegiance, by laying down the entire time. I wonder how many people who are following Jesus Christ today are really faithful. And that's going to be put to the test when unexpected sacrifices begin to show up on the radar screen. Hawkeye the Labrador. This was a, an internet sensation several years ago. Here's a gentleman who came to our seminary for a week from Dallas Seminary. He was teaching there at the time. And, you know, sometimes you meet people and you can tell right away, I mean, this guy is unique. He's different. And such was Norman Geisler, who died last year, by the way. But when I began to dig into his background and find out where he grew up, it just uh, kind of blew me away. He grew up in Warren, Michigan, which is just north of Detroit, because he was invited to their daily vacation Bible school by another friend. They rode the bus to vacation Bible school. He liked it so much that after vacation Bible school was over, he kept going to that church year after year after year after year. And it wasn't until he was a senior in high school, having gone to that church for all these years, that he finally committed his life to Jesus Christ. And then he said that the people would ask me questions about my faith I didn't have an answer for. So he said, what I did is I started digging into my Bible and I found answers, and it eventually led me into studying in the field of apologetics, which basically means de defending your faith. And God used this man to co-found two fundamental Christian schools in this country. You know what really touched me as I kept digging into his story? He said he rode this bus year after year after year after year, and then he said, what if the bus driver would have stopped driving that bus just a day or two before he committed his life to Jesus Christ? What if he just folded up the towel and threw in the towel and quit and give up? 
Norman Geisler said, I have my ministry. He had his ministry because of a faithful bus driver that nobody knows what their name is. Faithfulness. Now, we come to this passage this morning, and Jesus is walking to Calvary. And he wants you and me to be faithful. And so I've tried to approach this paragraph that way. A faithful servant, Jesus says, has to have a clear vision of something. And I'm going to narrow it down to two things. Number one, what is really important? And by the way, what is really important if you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, he nails it here. Verse 41, he's Peter raised his hand. He interrupted the Lord while he was speaking, evidently. He said, Lord, uh, who are you telling this parable to? You just told us to be ready. Us, the apostles, or everybody? And I noticed Jesus didn't even bother to answer the question, but notice how he answers instead. He says in verse 42, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? There's the key word. Qualified by faithful and wise, but steward is the key word. Whom his Lord shall make a ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. Steward, if you dig into the word, means you're the manager of the household or household affairs. If, for example, there's a McDonald's over here in Bluffton and I suddenly become the manager somehow, doesn't mean it's my McDonald's. It just means they assigned me to be an overseer of that McDonald's. And I'm in charge of the person at the cash register. I'm in charge of how your food is cooked. I'm in charge of the parking lot. I'm in charge of the whole thing. But it's not mine. And I have to constantly remind myself that there's someone over me that I have to give an answer to. This is putting it down where we all live. Jesus says, are you a steward? Do you see yourself? Do you realize when you signed up to follow Jesus, he asked you to be a steward, a faithful and a wise steward. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4 that it's required. In stewards, that they show up. <laughs> that would be a good place to start. That you're, I can count on you day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. I, I, you are dependable, and I can count on you. How are we doing so far? Faithfulness means I agree to do what I've been asked to do, even when there are unexpected sacrifices that show up in the way. So Jesus starts by asking us to be a steward. Now, Peter is the one who raised his hand in the verse above. Stop the Lord in mid-flight. And Peter, when he wrote his little epistle, he said, As every man has received the gift, even so minister that gift one to another as good stewards of the multifaceted, many-colored, various kinds of the grace of God. Now, I thank God for Bob Rossman. He's here somewhere this morning. His teaching, First Peter, on Wednesday nights around here. And as he said this past Wednesday night, it's just filled with theology. And one of the things you see that touched Peter's heart as he followed the Lord, he was just overcome with the grace of God. And Peter realized more than anybody else, it seems like, that God has a various colored diamond of grace. When you just rotate it, it just is so brilliant. It dazzles you every hue cut. And color of that diamond. And part of the grace of God is his salvation. Have you been saved by the grace of God? That's a good question this morning. Do I know for sure if I died right now, I'd end up in God's presence? That's all by grace. That's called saving grace. But when you're saved by grace, then he begins to do a work of sanctifying grace in your life. Are you being sanctified? Much of the book of 1 Peter is about suffering. Did you know God gives you greater grace when you go through unexpected trials? So Peter knew about the grace of God. And God calls us to be faithful. What's important, number one, that I be a steward, but what kind of a steward? A faithful steward. The word faithful there is a person who shows up. He's faithful, fulfilling what he's agreed to do, when difficulties come along in his life. And again, look at verse 42 here. The Lord said, who is that faithful and who is that wise servant? In the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses a church that was going through a time of incredible suffering. Be the church of Smyrna. Around the end of the first century, 
You look at Fox's Book of Martyrs and you can read ten waves of persecution that swept over the church. Beginning with Nero and ending with Diocletian. That's when you had the, uh, what was it, the underground tunnels called the catacombs that went for miles and miles and miles. In fact, Christians who survived down there would bury their loved ones in the side of those carved out tunnels. And notice what John gave to that church who was suffering. He said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil is going to cast some of you into prison. I remember they didn't expect, that wasn't on the radar when they signed up to follow the Lord, was it? But the devil is going to cast some of you into prison so that you might be tried and you shall have tribulation. Ten days, those ten Roman emperors that would take their hate and venom out on the Christians. He says, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So the steward is called to be faithful, and he's called to be wise. Let's not make this difficult. Wisdom is simply being able to see your situation the way God sees it from heaven. Do you ever look at your situation and see it the way God sees it? Most of us are stuck, unable to see the forest for the trees in front of us. But you take a helicopter and rise up above the forest and you can see, okay, I'm here at point A. And God wants to get me to point B ultimately. But oftentimes he takes you all around that forest to develop your character and allows you to experience trials you never knew would come into your life, right? And so a wise steward looks at that and says, hey, wow, it's going to be icy between Arlington and Bluffton where I work over at the McDonald's. But I'm going to be faithful anyway. I'm going to allow these trials to develop God's character in my life. So that's what Jesus was saying to Peter. I'm willing to go through whatever it takes. And finally, I'm willing to keep going for as long as it takes. The Lord said, who is that faithful and wise steward whom the Lord shall make ruler over his household to give him his portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that man, he says in verse 33, that steward whom his Lord, when he comes finds him, look at this, just doing what he's asked to do, doing what he has been asked to do regardless of the circumstances, whether it's pleasant, sunny, sunshine, nice weather like we're having today, or whether it's inclement weather, whether I've got difficulties in front of me or not, I'm just going to keep staying steady, staying faithful to the Lord. So what's important in the Christian life? Number one, that I understand God wants me to be a faithful and wise steward. But much of this paragraph is devoted to the second thought here, and that is why is it so important that I show up when I'm asked to show up and I do what I've been asked to do, and I do that regularly, faithfully, with a good spirit, and I do it understanding that the difficulties that would stop the average person are God's allowing those difficulties to make me into the kind of person he wants me to be. Well, number one, in verses 44 through 48, God begins to tell his followers, Jesus tells his followers, that the faithful steward is going to be greatly rewarded. And the unfaithful steward is going to be greatly punished. It's as simple as that. Wish I could color code it, sugar code it, I should say, so that it can be digested easier. But that's just what Jesus says. I believe things are turning right before our very eyes. And the church is going to have an opportunity to display what we're genuinely made out of. I mean, there are going to come things down the the pike that you never saw coming. But God wants you to be faithful regardless. Now, Now, let's notice, this has always struck me the way God does this. In verse 44, of a truth, I'm telling you something. He's going to make him ruler over all that he has. Now, wait a minute. If you go up to verse 42... The Lord was going to make him ruler over his household to give them their portion and do me. He was just a faithful steward doing little things in verse 42. But notice verse 44. When I come again, the master says, I'm going to make him ruler over all that I have. We've got to talk about that. God rewards in such unique ways that we don't think of. Why don't we think of rewarding somebody? We think of, okay... You rake the leaves, here's a $10 bill. Thank you for raking the leaves. You mowed the yard, here's a $10 bill. Thank you for mowing the yard. 
But if you think of it in terms like this, my wife's a school teacher, and some others here are school teachers this morning. School teachers understand this. If a student does really well at third grade, which is what my wife teaches, at the end of the year, that student is rewarded with something. Guess what it is? They get to go into the fourth grade. And if they do really well in the fourth grade, guess what? They're rewarded again. Fifth grade. Greater, more responsibilities. That's the way God does it. And if you find yourself teaching that Sunday school class that you've been asked to teach, and you do it consistently, you do it faithfully, you do it as unto the Lord, don't be surprised if leadership's not observing you. And they come to you quietly and say, listen, you've done such a great job here. We have other needs over here. Would you mind helping out in those other responsibilities? I mean, sometimes people come to church and wonder why they're never asked to do anything. You ever met a person like that? And you ask them to do something, just a little small thing, and they never show up. My Bible says if you can't do this, you certainly won't do that, right? He that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful also in that which is much. As a matter of fact, Matthew 25, verse 21 says, and this was when Jesus told the parable about the, uh, the householder that was away. He was going to come back, and he had entrusted three different servants with various responsibilities. One had five talents, another had two talents, and one had one talent. When he came back, verse 21 says, he found that the one with five talents did a great job with those five talents. He invested those talents, and he brought in return. And his master looked at him, and he said, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you now ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Thy Lord, personally. Same thing with the one that had two talents. And by the way, some people are gifted with five talents. <laughs> I'm not wired that way. There are people that can sing and dance and teach and preach and do it all, right? I thank God he gave me the one talent. And when I was a young Christian, I said, God, whatever happens, I'm going to give that talent to you. Let's see what happens. Here I am 42 years later. The guy that had the two talents went out and did the very same thing. He made good investments. And God said the very thing, same thing to him. Come and enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. I want to make you rule over many things. But when he went over to the guy that had one talent, he said he was scared to death of his Lord. Because he had no relationship with him. And he said he went and buried his talent, hid it in the earth, and waited for the master to come. And I mean, the Lord got angry with that servant. And did pretty much what we're going to see happens to this unfaithful servant at the end of this paragraph. So let's not make this complicated. God's looking for stewards in this church this morning who are faithful, who are wise. And it's so important because he's going to, at the end of the day, he's going to reward the faithful steward. But he's going to punish those who've been unfaithful. So let's look at it. You have your Bibles, verse 45. Verse 45 says, But and if that servant says in his heart, My Lord is taking his time. He's dragging his feet. He's tearing, literally is what the Greek says. Delaying his coming and shall begin to what? Strike the men's servants. Imagine a manager at McDonald's. Physically striking, beating the men servants and the maidens. You can't do that. They're not yours. They don't belong to you. But this guy was doing it. He shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and be drunk. Which, by the way, is the total opposite of what Jesus taught in the last paragraph, which was to be ready. Eyes wide open, awake. And this guy is completely falling asleep. He's in a drunken stupor. It goes on to say in verse 47, and that servant which knew his Lord's will. I'm sorry, verse 46. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut, literally separate asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. What in the world is Jesus telling Peter and others who are listening to what he has to say? He's talking about this guy's attitude. He's gotten himself into a position where he really doesn't believe that Jesus is coming again. By the way, we're doing Revelation on Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Tonight, chapters 4 and 5, we're taking a trip up to heaven. You don't want to miss it. I believe God would have a great opportunity right now if he sent his son Jesus for the church. It's called the rapture. Everything unfolding as it is, I'm convinced we're right there. And in a split moment, 
the trump is going to sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. You and I, which are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and we're forever going to be with the Lord in the air. He's going to have a great opportunity right now to do that. But this one steward in the story here, he had this attitude that uh, God doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about our world. He's been gone so long that he's completely forgotten about us. By the way, Jesus has been gone quite a, quite a long time, hasn't he? Since those disciples went out and saw him go up off the Mount of Olives. And they were told, why are you standing here gazing up? The one that went physically and literally is going to come in like manner. It's been 2,000 years since that's happened. And so this unfaithful steward copped an attitude. The attitude that says, I can do as I please as long as the master's gone. I can beat, I can ill treat those who serve under me. His other attitude was, I've got plenty of time to make things right before he comes back. And both of these are very dangerous attitudes to adopt. And you might want to examine your heart this morning. I mean, do I get out of bed every morning thinking this could be the day that Jesus comes again? And it's going to cause me to have fire in the belly. And I'm going to sing with all my heart, as these folks here did a few minutes ago. If God asks me to teach, I'm going to give it all I've got. If he asks me to preach with my one talent, I'm going to give throw everything I've got at it, right? His attitude was wrong. He thought his Lord was a way he could live as he pleased. Now, there's three types of servants. It's very important for us to understand these. As this paragraph closes... And I want you to notice these with me. Verses 45 and 46. It's that person here this morning who's playing a religious game. Did you hear what I just said? There are some people in churches today who look, act outwardly, externally as though they're the real deal. But deep inside, they have no relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's very, very dangerous. Let's see what... Jesus had to say about that. I'm going to read it again. It's so important. Verse 45. But if that servant says in his heart, my Lord's delaying is coming, he shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and eat and drink and be drunken. The Lord of that servant is going to come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour when he is not aware and he is going to cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbeliever. That is very frightening from a pastor's perspective. That there are people who go through the motions. But Jesus told Peter and those who would listen to what he has to say that I'm going to deal with this person's attitude. And I'm going to deal with this person's sin. And I'm going to hand down his sentence. The person that's here this morning who's playing a religious game, who's truly not born again, when they die will stand before the presence of God. In Matthew chapter 7 it says they'll hear these words from his lips. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. There was no relationship. You just played a religious game. You were a pretender. And you had so many opportunities. But you never took advantage of them. I can't imagine a person who would attend Bible Fellowship Church and hears the gospel week in and week out, week in and week out, never acting on that. And committing their life to Jesus Christ and begin to follow him and wonderful salvation. But that's the first one, first one that Jesus deals with. There's another one in verse 47. Look at it with me. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now this is the person who's preoccupied. They come to church, they come to Sunday school, they hear truth, and they say to themselves, I'm going to someday. Boy, you're right on line. That registers in my heart. I mean, my spirit is telling me what you're saying is the truth, but I don't have time to do that, Pastor. I've got this, that, and the other going. Matter of fact, I would be here tonight, but there's a ball game on. Didn't you know there's an important ball game going on at 6 o'clock tonight? And I mean, believe me, as a pastor, I've heard all the excuses now. For 42 years, I've heard the excuses. Jesus says there's going to come a day when people who had opportunities to do something for Jesus Christ have nothing to show because they were preoccupied with lesser things. How many of you are going to get around to doing something for Jesus Christ at some point? This was convicting to me this week. 
This is pretty sensational on the internet. It really spoke to my heart. How many of you walked in, in and out of Walmart and you've seen those uh, images, pictures on the side as you're walking in and out of people, kids usually, who are missing? And you, you know, you're walking and saying, well, I've got three things to get here. I've got five minutes to get all three things. And you see this sort of thing and just walk right by. And yeah, one day I'm going to get around and do something about this. Well, this is what showed up on the internet this week. A boy <laughs> came into Walmart. He looked over at those images. And he was so touched by it that immediately he got down and prayed for them. Me, I'm preoccupied. But what about when it comes to serving in a local church? Coming to giving your best to the master is simply being faithful with the little things that God has entrusted you with. Are you preoccupied? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, you better think about this. There's coming a day when all of us have an appointment to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian on that day, notice we're saved by grace. No question about that. But we will be judged based upon what we've done. Not good intentions. Every man's works shall be made crystal clear for the day. That speaks of a day we all know about, the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10. The day was going to declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire is going to try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, he shall be which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So Jesus talked about the faithful steward and the wise steward who invested his gifts, and he was made ruler over all the Father's household up in heaven someday. You understand that? Meanwhile, down here on earth, there's the one who is pretending and the one who's preoccupied, and he comes and finishes this paragraph with the one who's just plain ignorant. Look at verse 48. He that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes, but for unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. And of whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. You know, I have been down and over to, and the Lord's enabled me to go lots of different places in my Short lifetime. But I never will forget the first time out of the country down in, in 1985, went down to Lima, Peru. And to see some friends of mine, we went over the Andes Mountains. And when I saw them, they said, we want to show you where we started our ministry, missionaries. We got on a little plane and we went out into the remote Amazon jungle forests. And we got off. It was one of these planes where you sail into the water. And as we're taxiing up to the bank... The chief of this little small Indian tribe where they had a, a row of huts came paddling over to meet us. <laughs> he was out there spearing piranha. I'll never forget it. Because if we walked down that dirt, dusty path, they were cooking piranha on an open flame. And for their pets, I'll never forget, they had vines that they tied up spider monkeys to. Thinking, man, that'd be great to have a pet, a spider monkey like that, right? But they were so backward. They didn't have anything. I remember getting on the plane and coming back to Miami International as we circled and banked. I was looking out the window and saw, you know, home after home after home with swimming pools in the backyard. And it's tears came to my eyes thinking, man, the world here in America, they, they don't understand how most of the world lives. And yet. While I was there with that missionary couple, I met some of the greatest Christians. You could just sense in your speech, even though I couldn't speak Spanish, you could sense these people have a special relationship with the Lord. So they may not do things the way you do them. They may not know what you may know, and they may not have the modern means of communication. And if they do something in ignorance for the Lord, notice what this verse says. He who knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom, whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. And to whom much has been committed, much of him they will ask the more. Here in America, we have so much. And the bottom line question is, what are we doing with it? The Lord started this whole thing by asking his followers a, a, 
I would sit up and pay attention if I were you because a few months down the road is going to be the cross and your world is going to be rocked. But in preparation for that day, be genuine. In preparation for that day, be content. Preparation for that time, be calm. Be ready. And make sure you do that day in and day out. Be faithful. 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 Did Peter learn his lesson? He's the one that raised his hand to interrupt the Lord in verse 41. He learned his lesson. He wrote an entire little epistle. In that little epistle, he said, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. By the way, elder is a leader of a church, representing the church. We're going to see the 24 elders tonight in Revelation chapter 4, which is why I mentioned that. But it says, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but be of a ready mind. And don't be lords over God's heritage. Remember the one unfaithful steward who began to beat the men servants and the maids? He says, don't do that. Be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd comes, when he shall appear, you will receive a crown of glory that fades not away. What are you doing with the gifts, talents, and ability that God's entrusted you this morning? Are you preparing, faithfully investing them to have something to show when he comes? It reminded me of a story I read recently about a little boy who was asked to go out into the woods and with his mother and his aunt and a few other family members. And they were to collect blueberries with the understanding that they were going to go back home and his mother and his aunt were going to make a series of blueberry pies, all kinds. I mean, this boy loved blueberries. But while he was out in the woods with his pail, his small, he got the smallest pail he could find, and everybody else is collecting blueberries, he was chasing squirrels and following the butterflies, just having a good old time, but he wasn't working, wasn't doing what he was asked to do. Then he noticed it was time to go home. And he said, boy, I don't have anything in my pail to show for it. So he went over and found some moss and stuffed the bottom of his small bucket with moss. And he layered it with a few blueberries. And his mother commended him and said, you did such a wonderful job. We were all out here collecting blueberries. And look at your pail. It's, it's full of blueberries. That's wonderful. The mother went home and she made all kinds of pies. And she made a special little saucer pie just for him. And she set it in front of him. It was piping, steaming, and the blueberries were showing off the top there. And then he took his fork and he dug his fork into his blueberry pie. And guess what he did? He found that when he pulled it out, you guessed it, it was mostly mossy. You know, I read that it dawned on me that that is a reflection of my service to Jesus Christ right now. He's asking me to be faithful, faithful, faithful as I follow him. And as I'm faithful following him, he can arrange the difficulties of life to come in front of me. Obstacles, if you will. And if I choose to stop following him and sit down and do nothing, when I stand before him one day, that's going to be an awful day of judgment. And I've said here before many times from this pulpit, I want to hear from the Lord's mouth when I stand before him one thing and one thing only. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come and enter into the joy of thy Lord. I'm going to now make you rule over many things. I'm going to ask you, where are you at spiritually there this morning? Are you ready should things completely turn upside down in our country, in our world as a follower of Jesus Christ? So, Father, we love you this morning. Thanking you so much for your precious word to us because it's truth. And you've promised us in John's gospel that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We need freedom in this room this morning, Father. If there's someone here who's not saved, born again, would you set them free? By your truth. As Peter talked about your grace, if they've never reached out to the saving grace of God, and repented of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I pray they do that during this invitation. Other Christians here this morning, they're, they're going through some real furnaces. And they need your sustaining grace. Your sanctifying grace. 
your special grace that you've pledged to pour out on us when we go through fiery trials. Maybe they just need to come to the altar this morning here and pray and seek your face. But the bigger picture is it appears as though the church is about to go through the furnace. Where do we go from here? We just stay steady following Jesus Christ regardless of what happens in Washington. Lord, I want this church to be able to stand before you one day as a pure spotless bride. And I really want you to say of this church, well done, good and faithful servants. So bring us to that level of maturity, I pray. Work in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a veteran, I'm going to ask you to come down here to the altar at the end of the service. And I'd like for us to pray together. I'm going to ask Brad if he would lead us in prayer. But until then, let's all stand together. And we're going to sing, draw me close to you. veterans come to the front please and I'm thankful that Logan's here Logan I want you to come and stand by me on my little chair where I kneel down every day I've got Logan casket I prayed for you when you went through boot camp and you were having a rough patch at one time weren't you kind of like we talked about this morning I pray for Thomas Bell where's Brad this morning? I pray for Thomas Bell when he was over what was it Afghanistan and he took some RPG or something one day, or they ran over a mine, that's what it was. 
And he thinks he was spared because a pastor back home was praying for him. It's real, folks. Prayer is real. Our nation is going through the fire right now, whether you know it or not. The future is so uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. One day, Jesus is coming back for his church. And he wants us to be ready. And part of preparation is to be faithful, faithful, faithful. Just like a soldier who, when he goes off to boot camp, and it's so difficult, and he writes back and says, it's more, harder than I thought it was. Pray for me, Pastor. And I did. You came through. looks like to me you came through really well. I don't want to mess with you after church, okay? <laughs> it's like you're in shape to me. But thank all of you veterans. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your service. God bless America, right? Brad, you want to come over here and pray for our veterans this morning? Uh, please, you're up there. And when Pastor asked me this morning, my first got here, if I would uh, uh, close us in prayer and pray for our nation and for veterans, I was wondering, what is it that you want me to say, Lord? I don't know, I thought, uh, we've all been through basic training. Um, of course, if the rest of them will tell you, if they weren't in the Air Force, the Air Force really doesn't have basic training. It's more like a summer camp. But, um, but uh, it gives you some good nature ribs and some even services. So the, uh, all members of the profession of arms. Um, one of our uh, generals I knew at uh, Davis Monson, that's where I first heard that prayer. And it's always stuck with me. But um, we, we all took oaths of enlistment, or if you were officers, commissioned oaths. Um, and uh, the oath of enlistment, and it's the same for all services. We, we state our name, say, I grab a bell, promise, uh, <laughs> yeah, I knew I'd draw a blank. repeated the oath of enlistment like five times. You'd think I'd have it memorized to get up in front of a crowd and just blink. I grabbed the Thomas Bell promised us, promised to, uh, let me get it right, I don't want to mess it up. Because uh, I'm going somewhere with this, trust me. Just get the first words. I grabbed the Thomas Bell to solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will support the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulation and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. We all took that oath, or one similar, if they were commissioned. Um, and we live those words. Um, but I don't know if you all know it, but if you're a child of God, you are commissioned or enlisted in God's army. And we all have a duty, first and foremost, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors ourselves. One of, our, one of the guys in Sunday school read a passage um, uh, from Psalm 27, and I was looking at that. and. Uh, the first three verses stood out to me in, in, in light of our situation here in our country at this moment. I think uh, God was really pointing these out to me because um, as Philippians 4, 6, and 7 say, be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus. So we have nothing to fear. God establishes governments. God tears down governments. In Psalm 27, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. So we can all be confident. Number one, God is in control. Always has been, currently is, and always will be, no matter what happens. I don't want to thank each of these 
uh, gentlemen here for their service, for those who served in the past, for those who God has destined to serve in the future. But remember, we all have a duty as, as soldiers in God's army. So dear Lord, I just thank you for this day, for the freedoms that we have, Thank you for the privilege and the honor that I've had, that we've had to serve you. But I pray, Lord, that we would continue to do our duty as soldiers in your army, that we would be obedient to your will for our lives, that we would honor you in all we do say and think. I pray that you would protect our nation. I pray for those that are not saved they would, the scales would fall from their eyes and they would come to know you in salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. And Lord, I just thank you again for all of our veterans. Pray that you would guide, guard, and protect those who are currently serving. Keep them safe from harm. Draw them close to you. And we just love you, Lord, for all you do for us. For we don't deserve any of it. But you continually bless us. Help us to be worthy of that, those blessings, Father. Help us to never take them for granted. We love you, Lord, praise you, thank you, and pray these things in our Lord and Savior Jesus. Holy and precious name. Amen. Have a great afternoon. God bless you. Thanks for the service.